which heaven joys o bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler. Hello, welcome back to our study of how to interpret the Bible. We've already looked at the importance of this study. We've gone on to observe some various tools that we could use that will help us in the study. Well, last time we talked about various methods that people use to interpret the Bible. We discovered some flaws, some failings in a number of those methods. And at last we recommended one method. That method was the inductive method, a method whereby we take everything the Bible has to say about a given subject, put it all together, and examine it to determine what it is that God wants us to know about that subject. We did also observe that sometimes we have to use uh, inference in order to draw our conclusions, and that's because the Bible doesn't always state something just straight out. And we gave an example of that. Lot is never reported to have gone down into Egypt, but he is reported to have come up out of Egypt. He must, therefore, have gone down into Egypt when Abram went down to Egypt during the time of the famine. Now, today, what we want to do is observe that Jesus and his disciples used the inductive method. And we'll begin doing that by turning to uh, Luke chapter 24. Jesus has just been raised from the dead and two disciples, beginning verse 13, are walking to Emmaus, a, a little town nearby. Uh, we don't know why they were going. We don't know what their business was. We just know they were on the road. Jesus joined them. When he joined them, their eyes were, uh, in a sense, covered so that they would not know who he was. But they walked along talking with this stranger, you know, whoever it is. And the discussion uh, leads us to what we really want to observe about the Lord's approach to understanding Scripture. They're walking along. They're talking about everything that's happened in Jerusalem in the last few days. They're talking about the trial. They're talking about the, the uh, crucifixion. They're talking about the report that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And as they talk about these things, Jesus finally asks a question. Verse 17 of Luke 24. What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Well, you can imagine the shock of these fellows. Basically, they almost ask the Lord, Oh, where have you been, man? You've been in Jerusalem living under a rock or something? You know, because everybody knows about this. Listen to the way they put it. I think you'll see what I'm talking about. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Well, there's their report. Listen to Jesus' response and observe that it is a, a small explanation of the inductive method. Here's what he said. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. I wonder what Jesus had to say. <clears throat> Do you suppose he went as far back as Genesis chapter 3? Do you suppose that he reminded them that when God turned to the serpent, that he said that he was going to put enmity between the serpent, the seed of the serpent, and the seed of woman, and that ultimately the seed of woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent, but the serpent was going to bruise his heel. Do you suppose he went back that far? Did he refer to Genesis chapter 12, where God made the great promise to Abraham, In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Did he talk about Isaiah's writings about him, about the suffering servant as depicted in that great book? Do you suppose that he talked about the promise that was made to David, how that God would deliver the sure mercies of David and establish the kingdom of David's seed on the throne forever? I don't know what he talked about, but I know that he accumulated, put together all that the Scripture had to say about him. He used the inductive method to show them what they ought to know about the Christ what God had said about him in the long ago. Well, they stayed with him. As they got to Emmaus, they turned aside to go into the place where they were going to stay. And Jesus made as if he were going to keep on walking. And they said to him, uh, uh, Here, it's, it's late. Come, come stay with us. So a meal was prepared. Jesus prayed. And after his prayer for the meal, their eyes were open. They knew who he was. And they, were, they marveled at what? Well, listen to this. Verse 32. They said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while He talked with us on the road and while He opened the Scriptures to us? He opened the Scripture to them. They came to understand the meaning of Scripture because of Jesus' use of the inductive method. Interestingly enough, whenever they went to Emmaus, uh, to do must not have been very important because they immediately went back into the city and told the uh, disciples what had happened. And then Luke gives us a second report. Jesus came and stood before them, verse 36, before the apostles, we would say. And He said, Peace be to you. He began to communicate with them. And then He ate in their presence. And in verse 44 He said, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in Moses, the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. So here he goes now, surely including all of Scripture. Luke had told us he did the first time, but now we know he does because he deals with the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. He's got all of that together now in his discussion. Now notice verse 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Same idea that we'd already seen earlier when he opened uh, the understanding of those two fellows on the road to Emmaus. He opened their understanding of the Scriptures. How did he do it? He did it using the inductive method. But you know, Jesus wasn't the only one that used it. Turn over to Acts chapter 2 and observe that we find the Apostle Peter using the inductive method. Now, the question is basically, what's going on? You remember it. Uh, there had been a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Uh, the Spirit had descended like cloven tongues of fire on the heads of each of the apostles, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. A big crowd gathered around, maybe because of the sound of the rushing mighty wind. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, uh, are going to get a chance to talk to them. But not before the crowd discusses, how could all this possibly happen? How could each of us be hearing in the language in which we were born? Finally, some sage in the audience said, Oh, they're drunk. Well, I don't know about you, but I could honestly say, Well, it's true. Drunks do speak in a language all their own. But I wouldn't call it an un 
an understandable language. In fact, I think you could record the words of a drunk on the night he's drunk and play them back to him the next day, and even he wouldn't know what they meant. So Peter's going to pick up now on that argument, and as he does so, he will use the inductive method over and over again to explain to them what actually is taking place in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Let's start together at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Here he goes. You want to know what's going on today? Let's look back and see what all the Bible has to say about this day. And he particularly zeroes in on the prophecy of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And he recites it from beginning to end. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now Peter springs right out of that passage and begins to explain what they've seen going on again using the inductive method. Listen to him. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And then he goes to quote yet another passage that indicates what's going on in Jerusalem on that day. Here's what he says. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. He's quoted now from Psalm. Psalm uh, chapter, <clears throat> uh, chapter 68, I believe it is. Excuse me, that's incorrect. He is quoted from Psalm 16 uh, on this occasion. And what is he going to explain about it? Well, listen. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now think about it. We're going to use a little induction here. Was, uh, or inference. Was David talking about himself? The obvious answer is no. Because not only did David die, David was buried, and his tomb was still with them. He could not possibly have been speaking about himself. That's inference. But listen as we go on with this inductive method, and we find, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. All right. He's saying that passage then couldn't have been talking about David, so he's talking about Jesus. And since he was talking about Jesus, what did he say? He said, I will not leave my Holy One in Hades. We've already seen in our study that Hades is the waiting place of the dead. That when a man dies, body and spirit are separated. James tells us that in James chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 2, 
For as the body without the spirit is dead. That is important for us to see. Jesus' spirit was separated from his body. His body was laid in the tomb. But his spirit went to the Hadean realm to paradise. You remember what he told the thief on the cross? The thief begged him uh, on, on the cross. And Jesus' response was to say, This day thou shalt be with me, where? In paradise. Remember Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, we learned that paradise is the waiting place of the righteous dead. Jesus is saying today you and I will be together in the waiting place of the righteous dead. Our spirits will be there. But he also said he will not allow his Holy One to see corruption. Jews basically thought that corruption began on the fourth day. You can see a hint of that, I think, in the book of John chapter 11. Remember, Jesus goes to the place where Mary and Martha are mourning the death of their brother Lazarus. He goes to the tomb and he says, roll away the stone. The response of the sisters is to say, Lord, he's been dead four days. By now he stinks. We might use different words. We might say, by now he's corrupting. He's rotting. How long was Jesus in the grave? Not four days. Three days. He came up on the third day. God did not allow His Holy One to see corruption. And so it's on that basis that, uh, that Peter goes on to say, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's a quote from uh, Psalm 110, uh, verse, verse 1. There we, there we have it, that Jesus is going to be raised up, no doubt about it. God, God planned on it. He intended to do it. And now Peter's demonstrating that through the inductive method, they could have known that. They should have known that. And in fact, he says, we're all witnesses of this fact. You should have known it was coming. We witnessed it. God raised him up. Now watch him. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Of course, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. But what, what cut them? It was the inductive method used to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that God knew that Jesus was going to be crucified, that God never intended for Him to stay in the grave, that instead God planned to raise Him up, and that the church, the kingdom, would be established. So all those things are found within that passage because of a proper understanding of the Old Testament Scripture. Now, there's at least one more time that is a tremendous demonstration of this inductive method. And that time is when Stephen stood before the council. Stephen used the inductive method in order to present a powerful, powerful argument to the, uh, the assembled council on that occasion. You may remember that he starts his story exactly where you would expect him to start a story about the Jewish people. He starts with Abraham. Verse 2, Acts chapter 7. And he said to them, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now that must be a reference to Genesis chapter 11. I say that because it says before he dwelt in Haran. Uh, Genesis chapter 12 is when Abraham was in Haran. His father had died, his brother had died, and now God calls him again. But he begins with the first calling that is only referenced briefly in Genesis chapter 11. He goes on. And he said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. We saw that, end of chapter 11, 
beginning of chapter 12. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. By the way, that's a clear reference to Genesis 15. He's going right down the book, laying it out for them so that they know that history as he's going along. And they agree with him. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, says the God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob. And Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. Now he's rapidly moving through Genesis. But anybody that's read the book knows that he's following the inductive method to discuss God's dealings with his people and how they responded, as it were, to his dealings. Verse 9, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. I believe that passage is the first clear indication that the Jews always rejected God's spokesman. God spoke through Joseph twice through dreams. He explained what was about to take place. But they were envious. They hated him for it. They did not respond well to what he revealed. And that indicates exactly what Stephen's getting ready to pull out. And delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and a great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent, called his father Jacob, and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem. By now, Stephen's gone through almost through the entire book of Genesis, talking about what it says about the Jews, and particularly, again, remember, how they always rejected God's spokesman. But when the time of promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king rose up who did not know Joseph. That's the beginning of the book of Exodus, isn't it? This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. In fact, they rejected him, didn't they? Next verse. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, your brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did this to his neighbor, or did his neighbor wrong, pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Of course, Moses then fled, but God brought him back to deliver his people. How did they respond to Moses the deliverer? Skip on down to verse 37. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. Hear it again? They rejected Joseph. They rejected uh, Moses the first time. They rejected Moses the second time. Over and over again, in point of fact. 
in the wilderness, they rejected the leadership of Moses. But Stephen continues uh, <clears throat> as he talks about this. And he says, And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejected, or rejoiced, excuse me, in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rephaim and images which you made to worship. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers having received it in turn also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles whom God drove out before their face. But what happened? They rejected God again. Rejected Him so that He did eventually send them into Babylonian captivity. And finally, beginning in verse 51, Stephen concludes, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law from the direction of angels and have not kept it. Wow! What a powerful lesson, all done with the inductive method. In some ways, you could say Stephen covered the entire Old Testament. What is the interpretation method of Jesus and His disciples? Clearly, it is the inductive method. Jesus opened the law, the prophets, and the Psalms to declare all that was written about Him. We find Peter on the day of Pentecost opening up the Old Testament to reveal God's plan for, for the Christ. And then we find Stephen revealing that the Jews always rejected God's great leaders, including even the Christ. These conclusions all come from that method, and it's the one we'll recommend and use throughout our study. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun.